It's good to see everyone. Happy Friday. It's Friday. We've made it to the end of the week. It is good to be here with you all. Um, thank you for taking some time out of your day uh, to talk with us and um, engage in some really great conversation. Uh, my name is Kristen Young and I use she, her pronouns. I serve as the Executive Director of Leadership and I'm just excited to welcome you here to this conversation. If you are new to our virtual conversation series, uh, welcome and I'll set a little bit of the stage here for you. Um, we are all very familiar with Zoom, but this is the platform that we're going to use and as we go through our conversation here this afternoon. Um, we are going to uh, really use the chat feature which some of you have already done. Feel free to introduce yourselves and let us know where you are joining from as you um, as you come in today. But also feel free to use that chat feature as we go throughout the, our conversation today uh, to put in any questions that you might have or other thoughts that you also want to contribute. Maybe not questions, but just additional thoughts and resources as we engage in this conversation. And um, I and, and Juan will do our best to bring those those comments into our space as we're as we're engaging in the conversation. Um, as we begin to just center our space and think about where we are today, I want to offer this land acknowledgement um, and just think about where you are joining from and uh, what that means in terms of who was on that land and in that space before us and how they made it possible for all of us to, to be here today. Um, and so I offer that for you all to think about um, as we enter into, into the space. If you are not familiar with leadership, here is a little bit about us. Um, we are a not-for-profit that's committed to making change in the world by increasing the number of people who lead with integrity and a healthy disregard for the impossible. And we do that by bringing people together to have conversations, just like we are today. We think there's no nothing better than being in community with each other to engage in meaningful conversations and engage in this work. I also will offer you our definition of leadership as we kind of use this to frame our time together um, so you can see this is where we what we think about leadership and I think you'll see some of these components come out in our conversation today. So without further ado, I want to ask my colleague Juan to introduce himself as we begin to talk about um, how do we engage healing and honoring grief on campus? The, the series that we've been a part of this week has been talking about the impact of the multiple pandemics on our college campuses uh, over the last three years. And um, I'm so excited to have this conversation, conversation with Juan as we really think about the healing and the grief that also has occurred. So Juan, if you would uh, introduce yourself, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Kristen. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. My name is Juan Mendezabal. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Director of Program Quality and Management at Leadership. And today I'm excited to um, be in this space with you to chat about some of my favorite topics within leadership education and what my attention is really geared towards right now. And it has been validating in these conversation series this week to see how often the conversation has come back to grief and healing. Not because I'm glad that we have to go there, but because it means that I think we're on to something and noticing what comes next in our collective healing. Um, a little bit about me. I have had a career in K-12 education, in higher education, and as of November of last year, I began the full-time role with Leadership, and I am so thrilled that Leadership, in our mission of creating a just, caring, and thriving world, makes space for healing and grief as something that is not disconnected from leadership development or leadership education, but is actually a really critical component of that work as well. Um, I call myself an almost therapist because I almost was a therapist many, many times <laughs> because I don't know about you, but if um, folks have come up in higher education or any ed leadership background, healing and grief and trauma are not typically things that were educated on or trained on. At least I was not in my two um, education programs as a K-12 practitioner and as a higher ed practitioner. So as an almost therapist, I think I 
maybe started three different mental health counseling programs and finished half of an expressive arts therapy certificate at one of the institutions that I've worked at. So while I have no clinical credentials, and I want to make that explicitly clear, I am not a therapist. Um, what we're talking about is not clinical in nature. I am grateful for, and I, you know, I have been um, doing my own work to really claim that just because I don't have a degree in counseling doesn't mean that I still can't claim the knowledge from seven to eight different courses that I really did spend a lot of time and energy figuring out and knowing that ultimately this, this work for me lands in an education context. Um, so that is what I offer in terms of background with you today. Um, and a little bit about how I personally came to this work. Um, I, I came to healing work because I was single. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew that in order for something to change, I had to do some work with myself. And it the work worked. There's still more work to be done, but that was my initial motivation. And then during the multiple pandemics, especially right in the middle of 2020, I was like, wow, this work is really meaningful because I have some skills that I can use to make it through this really difficult time in my life, as many folks did, but I... Um, felt grateful to be equipped with what I needed to work through that time. So we'll talk about some of those lessons learned as well. Um, and so, Kristen, um, welcome to advance the slide um, to some questions to get to know one another. Let me launch that poll for you. Thank you. So would love to learn a little bit more about how you are coming in to this session today in terms of background, knowledge, experience. So this first question being, what is your current knowledge or experience with concepts related to grief, trauma, and healing? Um, and sometimes we learn about these topics because we're forced to learn about them because we are in grief and we are in trauma. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we have the academic knowledge or the language to describe what's going on, which is an important um, gap to bridge. So um, seeing for most folks, it looks like we're, we've learned some and also some brand new. So I'm glad that you're here and I'm excited to do some introductions, but by no means a comprehensive take at this topic. Um, great. So then maybe as we see these results here, which I was able to see just a second ago, here's where we're at. So thanks for sharing that with us. Then maybe, okay. Perfect. And then um, the second question. Is that something Kristen that I have to press? I'm pressing it, but it's it's telling me that it. Oh, there you go. Oh, there we go. Okay. There you go. Thank you. So another question: In which context are you currently seeing grief and trauma show up with students on your campus? And if you're not working at a campus right now, um, then maybe those last two responses are more relevant. But um, in all places, <laughs> it seems um this is showing up and it's pretty easy to notice pretty easy to identify because it feels like a a whole big mess that can be really difficult to navigate but um appreciate saying that it's also specifically appearing in co-curricular involvement i'm not sure if this is also just maybe reflective of the roles that folks have but um i taught um, classes at a university in fall 2022, and I saw it show up a lot there as well. So can also kind of share from an instructor perspective that the academics were very much impacted by that as well. So thanks, Kristen, for sharing that poll. And then thinking in our last question about you, um, I always like to encourage higher ed and student affairs folks or any educators or anybody doing human services work to also think about themselves and not be overly focused on our students and wondering, where are you right now? Are you still in this place of grief and loss and trauma because of these multiple pandemics? And um, as a reminder that any of these responses are perfectly valid because sometimes we're not sure. 
sometimes one day feels like we have it all together and we're feeling resilient and we're making it through. And then the next day offers a surprise for us that it catches up with us without us realizing it. And that's what trauma is, right? That's the the illogical nature of trauma is that it can sneak up on us and not always be predictable. So we're seeing that um, a decent spread of answers, but most of us in this space are still going through that ourselves. So thanks for sharing that. And that's helpful for us to understand how this work is both personal and professional in the different hats that we wear on our day-to-day -day lives. So then uh, moving into these ideas, some invitations, thoughts for today about how we might spend the next 40 or so minutes together. I believe, and I did not share that I'm also a doctoral student in a leadership program. And um, I love my program because it's very chill, very low stakes. So when I talk about my dissertation work, I think of it only with joy and excitement. And that is um, a privilege that that is the way that I get to frame that. And that is why I picked the program that I did. Um, and I think about why this means so much to me as a leadership educator, thinking about how the work that we do, and we know this, the work that happens in leadership education spaces can be healing. Whether we intend for it to or not, we know that students walk away from our experiences talking about the way that they've learned more about themselves, that they've been able to claim more confidence, capacity, motivation. So there's something happening there that we don't always call healing, but in my understanding of healing, those changes in self-perception that lead to more positive outcomes, um, to me, that is healing. That's what happens in a therapy space. That what That is what happens in any sort of growth space. So talking about what that looks like today, I want to cover some basic groundwork for those of you who aren't as familiar with trauma or healing or grief terminology, talking about what this looks like on your campus, and also talk about some potential pitfalls in healing work. Because with so many well-intentioned folks on campuses trying to do this work, I've also seen from my own experience the ways in which this healing work can turn south and possibly create more harm. So some ideas for what to maybe avoid on that. And then some further suggestions for how to keep developing these practices and competencies around trauma-informed leadership in education. So as we um, start together, I think it would be uh, a missed opportunity if in a trauma-informed sort of presentation, we don't actually do an embodied practice to bring us into the space as both an educational component, but also a modeling component of um, an embodied practice that helps folks feel more comfortable depending on their own experiences, which we'll talk about that, but wanting to start off with an embodied moment. And I um, show the window of tolerance here as an important tool that I learned whenever I went through my mindfulness teacher training through the Center for Core Mindfulness. The window of tolerance can actually be very comparable to what some educators may have learned in school as the zone of proximal development. Whenever we're teaching students that at that ZPD, we really want to find that sweet spot for challenging students enough that they're learning, but not making it so rigorous that they tap out. Well, emotional arousal works the same way. So in any mindfulness practice or trauma-informed lens, we always want to be what we call the, the middle of that window of tolerance, offering something that is challenging enough for someone to experience growth. If we're not stimulated enough, then we're not um, being fully embodied or even present sometimes, but also some real harm can be done when we overstimulate and ask folks to go to a place that they're not ready to go, and that can make somebody really averse to being back in this work at all again. So as I invite folks into a embodied practice together, um, we want to acknowledge that when we talk about closing your eyes or noticing your breath, those are not neutral experiences for everyone, depending on their traumas potentially. So the key to an embodied practice is as much agency and choice, even if agency and choice means that you don't do this with us for the next few minutes <laughs> and that you turn your mind off and do something else or you go and check your email because right now the idea of doing this is just not for you. Um, and if you find that this is in your window of tolerance, I invite you to join us. And you can decide moment to moment what your needs are. You might think that you're ready for this. And as you're in it, 
right? I think that's the the power of being able to shift and, and knowing that it's never too late to readjust our own needs and take care of ourselves. So um, with that said, if folks are willing or would like to go through a brief embodied practice, which is a mindfulness exercise called loving kindness, I'll invite folks into that. So as a way to get into that, either with camera on or off, whichever is more comfortable for you. And also if eyes open or shut are more comfortable for you, whichever way. Sometimes folks like keeping their eyes shut to be a little bit more grounded. Sometimes folks like to keep them open because that feels safer or even just gazing softly on the floor as some area of focus. And then if you have decided how you'd like to be with your eyes and with your posture, maybe just taking a moment to really arrive in this moment, noticing how the body feels wherever you're sitting, giving yourself the ability to make any tweaks. Is it your posture? Is it the way that you're sitting? Does the temperature feel okay? And then inviting folks into a deep breath if you'd like to. And as you're noticing the breath, remembering that there is no right or wrong way to breathe. And as we're in this state, the mind often likes to wander to anything else but this moment to the plans we have this weekend, to the to-do list waiting for us after this session is done. And an element of mindfulness might ask you to consider what it would be like to offer yourself kindness and grace when you notice that the mind has wandered away from this moment. Noticing when the self-judgment berating yourself for not being able to just close your eyes and be still. We can hear that voice and see it and say, thank you. And I'm going to come back to this moment over and over and over again. And so if we're in a state that feels okay for us, this practice of loving kindness is giving positive energy to other folks and ourselves silently within our own headspace. So what I will do is share a few sentiments such as, may I be happy, may I be healthy, may I be peaceful, may I be safe. It invites you to gear those phrases towards a few different audiences that when I set that context for you, if you'd like to, you can repeat those phrases within yourself while also cultivating that person or group that you might be wanting to gear those sentiments towards. So the first is actually to ourselves. Seeing what it's like to cultivate an image of yourself in your mind's eye, whatever image feels best for you in this moment. And seeing what it's like to repeat these phrases back to you. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be peaceful. May I be safe. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be peaceful. May I be safe. And now see what it's like to take those same phrases and bring to mind someone who you have a positive, uncomplicated relationship with. Maybe a partner or other family member a good friend, even a pet. 
And when you have that person cultivated in your mind's eye, see what it's like to offer these phrases to them. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be peaceful. May I be safe. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be peaceful. May I be safe. And now we'll switch to a group. So maybe for this session, for folks who are gathered together, what might that be like to cultivate loving kindness for one another? May we be happy. May we be healthy. May we be peaceful. May we be safe. May we be happy. May we be peaceful. May we be healthy. May we be safe. So again, just sitting with this moment, noticing the feelings, peace, relaxation, contentment, or frustration, confusion, any of the above. And as we exit this guided practice and back into our work, recognizing what this looks like, not only on an individual level, but some of these same practices of grace and patience that can be done collectively in a systems way in our campuses or in our context. So when you are ready, I invite you to open your eyes and come back and join us on video or not. And as I share a little bit more about um, these practices on this next slide, I also encourage folks, if you would like to share what your experience was like in the chat, whether meditation or mindfulness is a completely comfortable experience for you, or if that was new for you, would love and be curious to hear what that experience was like. And when I share this slide, I think about number one, judgment. And judgment is the thing that in mindfulness practice, we come back to over and over again. And as a trauma-informed strategy, we know that judgment is everywhere in the academy. <laughs> judgment is towards one another. Whenever we think about competition or credentials, judgment is towards ourselves for wondering why we haven't done more than we wanted to, or judgment towards the administrators that can be really easy for us to point our fingers at and um, use maybe more of a victim mentality that doesn't serve us. So the perfect mindfulness practice, it does not exist because for it to be perfect would also be a judgment. So just like a bad mindfulness practice doesn't exist, neither does a good one. And, and judgment could be something that we see as harmful if that's good or bad, um, as something that just gives us extra chargedness. So self-compassion can always be our way back to that. So um, we'll talk more about how that is integrated in some of these other concepts. But thank you for trying that out if you did, especially if that was uncomfortable or new for you. And um, appreciate the, the feedback in the chat. All right. So as we move on... <laughs> talking about some of these concepts in a more direct way. Um, there are lots of definitions. And so I'm sharing what I have learned through my own trauma training from a mindfulness lens that may offer a slightly different lens than others may have learned these terms in. So if you have more to share or different lenses on any of these, I would really love for you to share that in the chat because these, um, terms are more complicated than we can define on a few slides. So this is just really a starting point. But when we say trauma, here's what we might be talking about. And this comes from Janina Fisher, whose work 
really has informed a lot of clinical mindfulness practice. And she says, once thought to be a rare event, we now know that traumatic experiences happen to millions of human beings every year. Whether the trauma is a long-term exposure to a traumatic event or a single catastrophic event, all human beings are vulnerable to trauma or impacted by the trauma experienced by those they love. What most individuals do not know, however, is that a traumatic event is not over when it's over, even if we have successfully survived. So surviving can be a really relative term um, that implies finality and termination, which is not how trauma works. So to go even deeper on the next slide, we can think of trauma as kind of um, a, a shorter blip as the wound that was left behind from the actual thing. So the thing happened, and here's what we carry with us after that, whether we realize it or not. Again, going back to that idea of surprise when trauma creeps back up on us. So Gabor Mate, who also does a lot of work in a kind of different um, health lens, but still relevant, I think, and connected to other definitions, that trauma is not what happens to you, but trauma is what happens inside of you as a result of what happens to you. So again, talking about the consequences of the incident itself or repeated incidents. And back to Janina Fisher, that trauma is more likely to be remembered in the form of sensory elements without words, emotions, body sensations, changes in breathing or heart rate, tensing, bracing, collapsing, or just feeling overwhelmed. And this is why somatic work and body-based work can be really, really helpful for healing. And of those many uh, dead-end counseling courses <laughs> that I took, although, no, not dead-end, because I you learned from them. They're not dead-end. In terms of a degree, they were um, incomplete. But for me, I learned a lot. Um, that my somatic experiencing class was like, 10 years of therapy <laughs> combined. Um, and, I, and I noticed that now, even in small ways. So for example, uh, I was watching um, old episodes of How to Get Away with Murder when um, Annalise Keating is in the hospital. And um, when I watched that show last, I had not had any medical issues, but in the last year after being a cancer patient and being in the hospital and even hearing the sound of beeps, um, or even like the idea of going out to dinner, I got takeout during one of my cancer treatments at a restaurant that now I can't eat at again because the sensory experience of that food and that sound brings me back to that trauma in a way that I would have never expected before. So again, we want to think about that it, it doesn't have to be a replication of the original event in order to still feel those consequences, just like COVID-19 may not be happening in the same way in future years. And yet we're still reeling with that, right? There might be, although, you know, in a white supremacist country, we know that this happens every day, whether the news shows it or not, but a George Floyd murder was a highlight in 2020. And yet those consequences are still happening every day, even if that news story has erased itself from the media. So thinking about how long it takes for us to find, if ever, um, resolution or peace and in, in really thinking about the tools that come with that rather than seeking a sense of finality. So another way to show this on the um, next slide is what happens when our nervous system is engaged in those moments. And that could look, bringing it back to a campus context, I'm thinking of class of um, uncertainty. So what was once kind of a normal thing of a student asking in, you know, September what the final exam is going to be like. And as an instructor, I'm like, don't worry about it. We're going to talk about it later on. And then kind of unpacking later why that is that students have been really accustomed to not knowing what's coming. And with so much uncertainty, certainty can be a thing that can feel really grounding and stable and safe. So many of us are curious about things that we're not sure of or don't know. Um, and that can, that, can, that can show, right? That when that information wasn't available on the syllabus three months in advance, here's what might have been happening to that student and other students. Um, when the arousal of the body increases, we know that the trauma response being a physical sen sensation can look a lot of different ways. So when we're in that lower tier of being ready to be connected in a social context, those are all of the things that we're feeling. 
And some of those words can actually cue us into the fact that we're having a trauma response to something. And, um, and having that in mind can be really helpful because as we've talked about a few times, we may not even realize that the response we're having is a trauma response, that we can mistake that for just being tired or just being stressed out, but actually we're responding to a very familiar feeling or a very familiar incident. And our next slide shows what that looks like over time. So grief being the emotions, the stuff that we deal with because of trauma responses. Um, I learned this in undergrad, actually, when in a leadership in groups class, I was interning with a hospice um, nonprofit that worked with kids. And when they would talk to kids and they would use the wave model, I really didn't know what they were talking about. And then I realized how important it was, especially for kids, to normalize the idea that waves are what grief feels like, that the waves in time may become a little less steep and they become a little less frequent, but they are still there. So things like anniversaries can often bring back moments of grief. Um, familiar people can bring back grief, even when we thought that that person or that situation was long behind us. And then, oops, all of a sudden the body is saying otherwise. So that can be an, another important thing to think about on our campuses because many, um, many folks that I saw on campus and have worked with really embody the mentality that COVID is done. So our students need to get back with it. Our students need to stop saying they're tired. They need to stop asking for extensions. They need to stop um, pretending like we're back in 2021 because we're not anymore. And like, that is totally not how this works. The WAVE model shows us <laughs> that the accommodations and extra care that they need is going to last for a long time and hopefully always because those strategies that many of us employed during that time of extra grace are things that really should be norms. And my experience was that even student affairs, um, a profession that espouses care and um, compassion and humanization, that is not always what I saw in our lived values. One, it's a reminder too to me as you're talking about this, that one person's grief journey through a process is not the same as someone else's. So even though we all experience, like we all lived, we experienced COVID-19, but the way I experienced it and the way you experienced it were very different. And so our grief processes may be very different. And I think that it can be for any experience in life. I think sometimes we time to maybe form a connection with someone who might share a grief with a, an experience that causes grief, but then realize that maybe that isn't the same for from one person to the next. Yeah. I think that gets to what you're talking about, about on campus of there are people that are like, yeah, let's just get back to normal. And there are people who are like, no, I need more. I need more. I need more time. And mm -hmm. being okay with both of those. Yeah. Thank you for that reminder, Kristen, because that also explains why students who may have um, been comparable in terms of involvement or in terms of excitement, right? That, that that group also doesn't monolithically move on to the next step together, even if pre-pandemic, they may have presented as pretty consistent. So right. thank you right. for that. And then um, a last thought for framework before I would love to hear some more examples about what this is looking like is um, talking about multiple pandemics. So not just COVID-19, but also racial pandemics and economic pandemics and all of the things that are going on. For folks who may have been at Jamie Washington's virtual conversations session yesterday, a slide that got a lot of attention and impact was just a visual screen of pictures, probably like 20, 25 pictures of all of the huge catastrophic traumatic events that have happened just within the last few years from the insurrection to vaccine availability to um, all sorts of things that we think about who is being impacted most by this. And what I appreciate about the Center for Core Room Mindfulness where I got my training is that that equity lens and social justice lens is never missing from a trauma conversation. So as this says, if this inescapable threat of trauma 
it causes chronic stress, which has all sorts of interesting health outcomes. And by interesting, I mean really awful health outcomes, that chronic stress is not a coincidence, that for all of these marginalized groups, the potential for harm is a little bit more consistent when just living your life poses a threat, which um, folks who carry relative high um, identity privilege do not have to worry about that in the same way. So when we experience an escapable threat, the nervous system is always scanning for what is going to be dangerous to me and what feels familiar. Um, and even if familiarity is still a bad thing, we're still trying to recognize it as a protection method. So this is obviously exhausting. And a lot of students right now, especially immunocompromised students going back on campus are still wondering, and I had that experience returning from cancer treatment, but still being immunocompromised. And I was the only person wearing a mask often in different settings. And I was like, oh, wow, this sucks. Um, it was a lot easier to be going through treatment <laughs> when um, we were all doing the mask thing and what happened. So something to think about as when we have the power to create spaces and create policy on our campuses, you know, and maybe the mask example will not always be true in time, depending on the person, but um, where are those spaces that we have the power to create that can give people a moment, even if it's just a moment from that um, chronic stress that they know that in this class or in this program or in this office, that that constant threat may not be a reality the way that it is when we step outside of campus or step outside of that space. Um, because we know that the, the systems that are plaguing this chronic stress or creating this chronic stress, we can't just love students enough to make them go away. I think sometimes we that's one of the pitfalls of healing, right? It's like, as long as you come with me and you're my mentee, I promise you're going to be just fine. Don't lie. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> you can't save them from these systems of oppression. Um, you can create moments of safety, however. And I think that's what we have more of a responsibility to do than than trick our students into thinking that we 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 can solve all of it because right now we can't but the systemic work and the campus work can be parallel and um, synchronous. So. so a question for you all is, what does this look like on your campuses or in your context right now? And dropping whatever seems relevant in the chat. So maybe I'm thinking, for example, beyond just people are um, tired and exhausted. Like I'd even be curious of a specific story or a specific incident that is really showing what grief and trauma and healing are looking like right now, especially because it can be really difficult to to notice that. Um, for me, what I'm what I'm noticing, and maybe this is a different spin on the question, so folks can take this whatever way they would like. As maybe you're thinking about your examples, is um, I noticed whenever I was teaching last semester, for the first time in my life, I really felt myself let go. <laughs> as an instructor, and not from a place of apathy. But I think what I realized in my own grief and healing is that I, I can't hold all of this together. How could I possibly? And how does that actually humanize me more as an instructor or as an advisor or as a director of an office to, to work with the people to say, can we all just not be perfect right now? Can we all just really, can we just stop that? So never in my life as an instructor have I just given so many more extensions or attendance just became not unimportant. There was still accountability, but there was grace and a lot of flexibility with that that really didn't take that much more effort from me. But in my own experience, even as someone who considers himself um, a little like countercultural and defiant against higher ed, I still notice that I got got in my socialization in higher education as someone who takes everything really seriously. And in the sacredness that in the academy, everything has to be so perfect. And that my reputation as an instructor is going to suffer if anybody else learns that I'm giving extensions or that I don't guilt trip my students for missing class or that it's okay if we cancel something because we're all really tired. And I'm like, who taught me that? And even if that wasn't explicit, it was still very much internalized and it was still very much known that my reputation as a professional was going to be based on my rigidity. That doesn't feel like me. That doesn't feel good. And that's also, again, counter to what I profess in this profession and individually. So letting go was something that I very much learned how to do 
And, um, and guess what? Everything was fine. <laughs> Everything was totally fine. People still learn stuff and stuff happened um, and probably more comfortably than it would have been before. So those were some of my lessons learned about just embracing the grief. So um, moving kind of forward from that and would also definitely invite folks to, to share if you've seen any of these pitfalls, because this is a passion area for me knowing that higher education and student affairs has pulled a lot from the clinical mental health counseling field, but I don't know that many of us, and even myself included with some casual coursework, um, is capable of using some of these terms and ideas correctly, because what I'm hearing are a lot of inconsistencies and maybe inaccuracies of the ways that we're using language to describe our experiences or students. So, for example, um, when we say that we're caring for students as a result of the pandemic, what I have actually seen is a lot of enabling that when I, I've been hearing a lot of grace with accountability, grace with accountability. And my perception in some spaces is there's been a little bit too much grace, but not accountability that like, sure, you don't have to come in to, to work for like two weeks if you don't want to because you're tired and we're all giving grace. Well, actually, like. It can be both, right? There, there can still be some structure and some learning that, that is happening and making sure that we're not going way too far in saying that this is just a um, blanket statement of everybody do what you need to do. And there are no consequences because I think there's a balance to be sought there. Um, I've never heard triggering or being triggered used more than I ever have. And um, and and maybe sometimes people have learned that language and that actually is an accurate representation of what they're doing. But being triggered means actually re-experiencing a moment of trauma and, and being back in that state. Um, but sometimes we're actually not triggered, we're just upset. And being upset is also a perfectly okay emotion to experience. But triggering brings it to a whole other level that requires a different set of skills, a different set of reflection, a different um, set of support that we could maybe be a little bit more thoughtful in the way that we use that language. Um, or like, I'm triggered because somebody used a video that, um, you know, showed a clip from a movie that I really didn't like. I was like, okay, if there was a trauma response there, let's talk about it. What I'm hearing is actually just upset. Um, and then same thing for traumatized versus angry. I was traumatized by what this person said in a presentation because it, it I disagreed with them about this political stance. I was like, okay, again, let's talk about the full body reaction. And what did this bring you back to? Was it a, a trauma response or are you just angry? And the reason that I'm curious about these different uses of language is not because I want to police people's language, but because when we're talking about trauma, it really becomes complicated to figure out who is actually experiencing trauma and who's just upset because our attention and resources need to go to the real genuine trauma responses rather than what I fear has become trendy um, to, to be using trauma language as just a, as a way to escalate and to garner um, not, a, not attention for the sake of self-servingness, but to, um, but to prioritize maybe one's own reaction among others. And I find a little bit of danger in that. So resilience is what comes from that, right? In the spirit of that, that's, that sometimes things need to feel hard. <laughs> sometimes things need to feel really, really hard. So I, I hope that we're continuing to challenge our students and not, um, and not just letting folks do what they need to do because there's a really important skill to be learned with all of this challenge. And thank you, Dimitri. That word weaponizing is exactly where my mind is at. So I appreciate that contribution. My co-facilitator Lillian has decided to move about the room and make some sounds. So that is her contribution for today. <laughs> um, okay, and so then as we move on and love to leave with some specific thoughts, suggestions that maybe open up to some Q&A or conversation is what do some of the practical suggestions for moving forward look like? One specific one is the idea of healing as a as a process rather than this linear fix. I think um, capitalism might be at play and in influencing us and in thinking that healing is something that can be 
um, begun and ended as if there's a healing assembly line in a factory. The, the trauma can be created and the trauma gets shipped off. Um, I think it's really more like a baggage claim. Where we just see that bag of trauma coming around over and over again. And sometimes the baggage claim isn't moving and sometimes it moves quite fast. So maybe, maybe a loop rather than a line is a more helpful way to think about it. Um, Connecting back to leadership education, where I think we have real power as leadership educators, is that we learn a lot about our students and our programs. Even at the, the Leadership Institute, when I'm at a campus for four days as a co-lead, I know a lot about these students. And what I think could be helpful is instead of just thinking of our collective information gathering as just fun facts about somebody. We tell real stories. We tell really important stories to one another in this work, or even in a semester-long leadership education course in a leadership minor. I also feel like I learn really important information about people, whether that is um, for the first time in my life, I learned that when my parents said that my brother was the natural born leader and that I was going to be a really great follower, that like that was gendered. <laughs> that was like... And so this is a critical consciousness. And as a leadership educator, we can actually think of that as a healing moment. Like, let's go into that. Let's work with that. Because what you're actually undoing is not only socialization, but also gender bias and also sexism. So what does that mean for you to use this moment in this class to reclaim the power that was taken from you? That is huge. And I think we miss a lot of those moments in leadership education by just thinking of them as a light bulb moment or a takeaway. But there could be some really significant personal shifts that are happening as a result of those um, paradigm corrections that, that we do in our work pretty regularly. So then thinking about other strategies, building relationships based on trust and care is one of the most important ones. And going back to that idea of perception, um, when... I think of some of my colleagues had learned that I spent really the first two weeks just doing relationship building things in class. They were like, well, they're not paying to build relationships. They're paying for content. And I was like, well, no, they're paying to learn. And I'm not going to sit here and say that everything that they need to learn comes from this textbook. <laughs> so that also builds more trust in you as a leadership educator or as a professional that you're willing to see the broader needs that they have as a human rather than just what seems to meet a curricular outcome. I also don't think that 15 weeks always needs to be packed with academic lessons in order for the experience to be a meaningful one. Agency, choice, and autonomy. How much choice can we give students? Whether that means selecting your own final exam, does that mean proposing course materials? Does that mean you get to teach the class today and we're going to talk about why and it's not because the instructor doesn't have something planned but because your voice is just as meaningful? This takes a lot for me to also think about because it's power. It's power being given away and even people who believe in blurring a um, student administrator or student instructor or student facilitator power dynamic will still get tripped up on this one because we tell ourselves, well, we're the ones with the expertise and we're the ones with the knowledge and we know how this is supposed to go. Um, but at the same time, that's incongruent with the idea that this classroom is a community and everyone's a teacher and everyone is a learner. So giving that power away and inviting more opportunity for choice could be an important thing. And then giving more opportunities for emotional state. When we would do emotional check-ins, we would have, it. Um, I thought students would find it a little infantilizing, but they actually loved it. It's like when little kids point to a chart of like faces for emotions. <laughs> We're like, how are you doing today? That's how we would start many of our classes. And so students were able to say like, I'm angry today. And I was like, great, well, we're watching this movie on toxic masculinity. How can we use your anger in this lesson in a really productive way instead of making, making it seem like your emotions don't matter or your emotions can't actually be useful in what we're doing today? So I think that's, that's always a way to help students feel like they're being seen in whatever struggle they're going with. And we've talked about this, making higher education less serious and humanizing the academy. Um, I have the luxury of saying this as someone who is now higher education adjacent rather than being in higher education more formally. Um, but if I were ever to go back to it again years from now, I would remember that I um, was complicit in losing some of my humanity 
and was complicit in asking students to shed some of theirs. And I thought I was one of the good ones too. Like I really thought that I was way ahead of the curve in that. And in hindsight, I'm like, no one, you bought into a lot of that stuff that you espouse otherwise. So it's um, something something to think about that, uh, how are we contributing to the very ideas that we're trying to dismantle? And then some specific examples around activities, um, crucible narratives for leader identities, what significant things in your life, trauma or not, or even joyful moments created the leader that you are today, whether that's from a personality piece, whether that's from um, interest. I um, learned in my doctoral program when I wrote my crucible narratives paper that the reason why I am a leadership educator focused on healing is because this middle child Enneagram 8 narrative of wanting to um, fight the system and change things um, is, is a really useful position for someone in leadership education. But the healing comes from the idea that the, the anger and the peace is usually found within rather than the external thing that many of us are chasing. So it made it really clear for me to identify why I chose the work that I did. And students could find that same level of peace and recognition from their own reflection as well. So then what I would love to end with as an idea for what this actually means, what would be the opposite of a campus or a space that is not trauma-informed, and that is a space of connection. So The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk is one of those books that has gained a lot of traction. It was a book that changed everything for me, and one of the things that he writes in here is that um, to be benevolent rather than malevolent is probably a true feature of our species. Being able to feel safe with other people is probably the most single important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. So like, what does safety feel like? How often do we approach our spaces saying, how could I make this feel as safe as possible, knowing that we can't guarantee it, but what effort have I put in to think that safety is at least a very thoughtful part of the construction? And then social support. So not just about numbers, but about actual connection. That social support is not the same thing as merely being in the presence of others. The critical issue is reciprocity, being truly heard and seen by the people around us, feeling that we're held in someone else's mind and heart. For our physiology to calm down, heal, and grow, we need a visceral feeling of safety. And the next slide is actually a little bit more physiology. And I, I love this image of these two hearts connected. And actually, when I went through training, um, an image that was used was actually a parent with their child on their chest with the idea that co-regulation is an absolutely physical thing, that when our bodies are regulated, we can actually help regulate other people's bodies just by physical proximity. And the same thing is true when we are dysregulated. <laughs> when we are in a dysregulated state and we are in physical proximity to others, we also have the power to dysregulate them in a way that may not be as helpful. So this co-regulation concept, being able to actually balance another person's nervous system is, is wild to think that we have that much power, but given physical proximity. So how are we choosing to regulate body in physical proximity as, as almost a magic trick, as a superpower to creating safety in a space? So if these concepts are interesting to you, I would love to recommend these. The Body Keeps the Score is more of a medical book. It talks a lot about PTSD, but also has some really important takeaways that that will probably be one of, one of my secular Bibles for years and years to come. Um, Trauma-sensitive mindfulness is also really helpful if you are a mindfulness person. Resma Menachem does a lot of work on what is called somatic abolitionism and talking a lot about the nervous system, particularly for Black folks from the institution of slavery um, and how our, our bodies and genetics make us more prone to illness and other trauma because of the ways that generational trauma has disadvantaged actual bodies. So that, that book blew my mind. If you teach, Teaching with Tenderness is a book that I would highly recommend that really falls under the it's not that deep category of higher education that did a lot for me to loosen up in the classroom. Um, process Not Perfection is around 
expressive arts and activities to do solo or with a group in order to bring more of an embodied approach to healing. And then always want to give credit to the Center for Core Room Mindfulness, where my training came from. They do incredible work and always appreciate that social justice is always at the core of how they think about mindfulness and healing. So I know we only have a few minutes left. Would love to turn it back to Kristen. And if anybody does have questions or thoughts or comments in the chat, would still love to see those as Kristen is wrapping us up. Yeah, thank you so much, Juan. It, I, I mean, I've taken more notes or probably my head has been like busy nodding in agreement with you for the last hour. I might need to do some neck stretches, um, but I do. I think it is so important as we think about uh, about trauma and about grief, about how we really bring that to the forefront in leadership development now and really help students also give voice to what they are they are experiencing because I do feel there is this push of, and it's not just in higher education, but I, I do think there's this push to just get back to normal. And I think someone mentioned that there's there was no accounting for what's happened and learning from that and doing things differently. And I and I see that in lots of different areas, um, but and especially in in education, but but not you know not only in that. So I you know I really encourage people to think about that too, even in your own day to day lives. Like how are you giving and thinking about this as it relates to you? And I think that's the a really a neat thing and a way to model that work for students, right? And I think that's always important for them to see that whether other people around them are doing that as not or as not I think that's important so thank you um always wonderful to spend time with you and to have other people join us and I get to spend time with one every day but it's great to have other people join us in the conversation and I hope you all found it as helpful as I did um in your own in your own daily work uh, and the things that you do. And uh, thank you all for kind of joining us. And thank you, Juan, for preparing and sharing so much of yourself with us, the stories that you shared. Um, and it really made it, um, made us understand why this is important to you and, and really, I think, relatable, um, at least for me. So I hope it was for others as well. Um, again, I'll end with this kind of final slide as we get to the top of the hour. Um, if there's anything that Leadership can do for you all in your work, any way that we can partner alongside of you or provide resources, uh, there is some information for you about programs we offer, but more importantly, it's just about the conversations. And so if there are things that you're like, I want to talk more about this and I want to know your insights and guidance, uh, please reach out to us. We would love to be there to support you in that way. Um, the final thing that I'll, let me see, I don't even know if that's the final slide. If you are, it is, uh, if you are, Leadership is a not-for-profit. And um, so if you um, want to donate to Leadership and help us to continue this work, the link is there to go and do that. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm just going to let you all know, uh, we will send the recording for this in all of the conversations from the virtual series out next week. Um, please feel free to share them. They are posted on YouTube. And so if there are people who you're like, you should watch this, I would like to talk about this with you. Please use this. Please use any of this information in your conversations and in the in the tools that you need um, uh, as you go forward. So thank you all. And I think Juan, I know you might stay around for a couple of minutes if people have other questions. <laughs>